going back to its very beginnings now on BBC Two, Dan Snow tells a story of extraordinary courage, athleticism and success. In 1887, a 27-year-old Methodist minister from Horncastle in Lincolnshire travelled to Madras, now Chennai, in India. Henry Lunn lasted a year as a missionary, long enough for his wife Mary to present him with a son, Arnold, and long enough to discover that Madras did not sit entirely well with his constitution. The Lund swapped the Indian subcontinent for the Alps in Europe. First, Grindelwald in Switzerland, and then Chamonix here in France. They started offering rugged retreats which would boost people's muscular Christianity. We would thoroughly have approved of this walk up to the glacier here above Chamonix, because what they were offering was the thrill of adventure in the mountains. The winter package holiday was born through Henry's cooperative educational tours, which became Lund Poly, in its day, the biggest travel agency in Britain. And what has any of this to do with the host city of the 2014 Winter Olympic Games? Sochi was made popular by Joseph Stalin, the much feared leader of the Soviet Union. He had a summer dacha here, and thanks to him, the Black Sea Resort became Russia's holiday destination of choice. adventures here in the Alps, perfectly possible that there would be nothing going on this year in southern Russia that would be seizing the world's attention. Sochi will be holding the Winter Olympics just over a century after international sport began on snow and ice. To tell that story, I've come here to the Alps, where British pioneers helped to shape modern winter sports. College, Oxford. Sir Henry Lund's son, Arnold, was a student here. And he spends his time dreaming not of Oxford spires, but of mountain peaks. He had inherited his father's love of all things Alpine. As a ten-year-old, he had watched in awe as his father's generation scrambled up and then threw themselves down the steep slopes in Chamonix. I studied here as well, but I don't think somehow I quite fit in with the description of Balliol students given by Herbert Asquith, who became Prime Minister. He studied classics here. He wrote that they had a tranquil consciousness of an effortless superiority. Might have been effortless for him. Anyway, Asquith was Prime Minister for six years before the First World War and the first two years of the Great War. The early 20th century the closing years of Britain's imperial century, a time of dominance on the seas and on land, an empire that at its peak would stretch over 13 million square miles, containing around a quarter of the world's population. It was also the age of adventurers. There was Robert Falcon Scott, Scott of the Antarctic, and another polar explorer, Ernest Shackleton. The requirements of running an empire and the spirit of adventure spawned a new passion for the British, organising sport. Sport on the playing fields of home and wherever in the world the empire carried the mother country's games. Athletics, golf, cricket, hockey, rowing, association football, rugby football, lawn tennis, croquet, all given shape and order, a universal set of laws by the British ruling class. For these serial organisers, no activity was beyond their reach. We live on an island of many bumps rather than mountain ranges, but it didn't stop the British tackling the Alps with their customary sense of orderliness. As far back as 1865, engraver, illustrator and climber Sir Edward Wimper was the first to reach the summit of the Matterhorn. His descent had ended in disaster as four of his party fell to their deaths. But despite the many dangers and the deaths, it didn't stop a whole host of young, ambitious climbers from coming out here to the Alps and trying to bag all these peaks. 
Names were forgotten now, but at the time were famous. Mummery, Winthrop Young, Stephen. But one name has survived. A man who trained here before his final assault on the world's highest peak, Everest, in 1924. Mallory, who climbed these peaks before perishing out in the Himalayas. The British led the way up the mountains, slowly, methodically, in an orderly fashion, but they also led the way coming down them, at speed. In 1884, Major William Bulpitz had built the Cresteron in San Moritz in Switzerland for skeleton toboggans. And now the Lunds were putting the British on skis. Grandfather was one of the people who brought people to the Alps, and you know, and he, he saw quite rightly that to go to the Alps um, in the winter is a marvellous thing to do, as opposed to sticking around in London and all the smog and the bad weather. One of my great grandfather's first parties, um, I think it was to France, there were about four skiers, and they had a guide. And the skiers asked the guide, When you're on these things, can you turn? And the guide said, I believe it's possible, but I personally don't know how to do it. The Lunds were bringing the British on winter sports holidays to Swiss villages like Venn, Adelboden, Murren and Samaritz. If perhaps more accessible than the climbing aristocracy, this was still skiing for the wealthy, the privileged, the resolutely amateur. It was people, largely speaking, who came from um, a club started by my great-grandfather called the Public Schools Alpine Sports Club. He made it pretty much exclusive to people who had been to university or who had been to a public school. Um, 